up, you beautiful bastards? My name is Philip. De Wait, no, I'm Mia Khalifa. Happy Wednesday. Let's just jump right into it. Yet another PDS host that I'm having to fire, Mia Khalifa. That said, despite Mia's unfortunate firing, if you'd like to listen to our brand new podcast together, conversation together on a conversation with podcasts, you can listen to it using the audio platform of your choice, using that anchor link down below, or you can watch it on youtube.com slash a convo with, where I actually just uploaded that before I uploaded this. Yeah, I release a new episode every Wednesday. Be sure to subscribe. It's just, it's been really fun. But with that said, buckle up, hit that like button, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing we're gonna talk about today is, uh, if at any point today I seem uh, low energy or less than enthusiastic, it is because, uh, well, I'm just sick. Luckily, it doesn't appear to be in any way connected to my surgery. It's just that I am a father of two and children are tiny little germ factories. But yeah, this has been a uh, less than ideal week. Anyway. Moving on. And then we had Jane the Virgin star Gina Rodriguez back in the news. And if you haven't seen, uh, Rodriguez is back in hot water, having reignited accusations that she's anti-black. This time after posting a video to her Instagram story of her using the N-word. Or rather, more specifically, in the now deleted post, Rodriguez, who is a Chicago native of Puerto Rican descent, rapped along with Lauren Hill's part on Ready or Not by the Fugees. Voodoo, I could do what you do, believe me. Give me heebie-jeebies. <laughs> so this is uploaded and people flock to Twitter to react. With reactions like, Gina Rodriguez has proven time and time again to be anti-black. Now she's out here saying the N-word and posting it on Instagram. Nobody let her crocodile tear her way out of this one. She's over. And that's seemingly in reference to a, a time that she was facing backlash before. She went on Sway in the morning and she cried. Another writing, Gina Rodriguez is an example of the bold anti-blackness of non-black people of color. Black people keep telling y'all not to use our reclaimed slurs. And here you go on your IG story, mouthing along to a song saying, the N-word, playing all in our faces, ugly, racist, and disrespectful. Now, following the post and the backlash, we saw Gina Rodriguez apologize. Hey, what's up, everybody? I just wanted to reach out and apologize. I am sorry. I am sorry if I offended anyone by singing along to the Fugees, to a song I love that I grew up on. I love Lauryn Hill. And, um... I really am sorry if I offended you. But really, that apology ended up just bringing another wave of backlash from people who argued that she wasn't directly addressing the issue. One tweet noting those two parts, I'm sorry if I offended anyone by singing along to the Fuji. This is an example of someone being deliberately obtuse. Gina Rodriguez knows she offended people not for singing a song, but for saying the N-word. If the apology is going to be insincere, just keep quiet. And so following this second wave of backlash, Gina Rodriguez issued a second apology. This time going into the notes app and saying, in song or in real life, the words that I spoke should not have been spoken. And adding the word I sang carries with it a legacy of hurt and pain that I cannot even imagine. Whatever consequences I face for my actions today, none will be more hurtful than the personal remorse I feel. Watching my own video playing back at me has shaken me to my core. It is humiliating that this has to be a public lesson, but it is indeed a much deserved lesson. I feel so deeply protective and responsible to the community of color, but I have let this community down. I have some serious learning and growing to do, and I am deeply sorry for the pain I have caused. And that is essentially the story. And I'd really love to know your thoughts on this because this is kind of just more of a high profile example uh, of a story and controversy that we've seen in the past. Right, the argument and debate about the use of the N-word in music. If the context and intent of someone singing along with a song completely changes the situation so it is no longer offensive. Or no, as we saw someone argue earlier, it is a reclaimed slur so only some people get to say it. Right, no matter the intent, no matter the context. But yeah, I'd really love to know your thoughts on this. Then, briefly, let's talk about Utah. If you're unaware, there is this proposed ban on conversion therapy in the state. A ban that would reportedly prohibit Utah psychologists from engaging in LGBTQ conversion therapy with minors. And the reason we're talking about this today is that the Mormon Church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, has come out against the ban, saying it, quote, fails to protect individual religious beliefs and does not account for important realities of gender identity in the development of children. And in response to this statement and stance, you'd LGBTQ plus advocacy group Equality Utah tweet, let's be clear, studies have found that more than 60% of children subjected to conversion therapy attempt suicide. It's long past time to protect youth from this dangerous practice. And as far as my reaction to this, I mean, well, one, I'm not surprised the Mormon church has this stance. You just kind of look at the history of what they've done or fought for politically. And two, it is my personal belief that conversion therapy should be banned everywhere. Notably, the American Medical Association and the American Psychiatric Association oppose it, with the APA also noting last year that attempting to change a person's sexual orientation carries with it a significant risk of harm by subjecting individuals to forms of treatment which have not been scientifically validated, and noting that no credible evidence exists that any mental health intervention can reliably and safely change sexual orientation. And I will say, I despise this argument that, that we're somehow attacking someone's individual religious beliefs by banning a horrid and abusive practice. And I will say, 
say, if you're somehow still on board with conversion therapy, just, just do a little of your own research. Look into the stories of those who are subjected to conversion therapy. It's a horrible, abusive, dangerous practice, and that's where I'll leave that one. But from that, I wanna share some stuff I love today, and today in Awesome, brought to you by Squarespace. Whether you need a domain, a website, an online store, or whatever, make it with Squarespace. Squarespace empowers people to create their online web presence or launch their new passion project. And with Squarespace, it's so incredibly easy. There's nothing to install, patch, or upgrade ever. It's intuitive and extremely easy to use. I mean, creating a beautiful website with Squarespace's all-in-one platform has never been so simple. I mean, from websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. And so if you wanna make the smart move like many from the nation already have, go ahead and start your free trial today at squarespace.com slash Phil. And then remember to enter an offer code Phil to get 10% off your first purchase. And the first bit of awesome is uh, one, in addition to, yes, you should definitely check out today's podcast with me at Khalifa. The next three guests we have on the podcast, we have uh, Julian. Julian Solomita, Gabby Hanna, and Jenna Marbles. Look forward to that. Then we had Cardi B captioning fans' Instagram photos. Then we had BBC Radio 1 giving us Paul Rudd unpopular opinion. We had the infographic show giving us how to lucid dream in your sleep in three minutes. Uh, Condé Nast Traveler gave us a Las Vegas penthouse you can't see without betting $1 million. We had Zach Galifianakis talking about bombing at Saturday Night Live. We got the trailer for Holiday in the Wild. Then we got the new Pokemon Sword and Shield trailer, which is maybe why you saw Charizard and Fat Pikachu trending. We got the brand new trailer for Bombshell, where we actually get to see some of what happens in the movie. We also got a new trailer for Lady and the Tramp. And if you want to see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, really anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. And then finally, let's talk about this big news and these updates around the escalating situation involving Turkey and Syria. And a quick refresher to get you up to speed, the last Wednesday, Turkey officially launched a military offensive sending airstrikes and ground forces into northern Syria. And this notably just days after the White House issued a statement saying that Turkey would be going ahead with its long-planned military operation operation in Syria. Also noting that the U.S. armed forces would not support or be involved in the operation, and also adding that U.S. military forces will no longer be in the immediate area. And that announcement appeared to come after a call between Trump and Turkey's President Erdogan, who claims the military operation is necessary to clear Kurdish groups in the region that Turkey believes are terrorists. But, and this is a huge but, one of the main groups Turkey is fighting is the Syrian Democratic Forces, who have been a key ally of the United States in the fight against ISIS. U.S. forces recruited, trained, and fought alongside the SDF for years. And not only has the SDF done the bulk of fighting against ISIS on the ground in northern Syria. They have also been the main people guarding tens of thousands of captured ISIS fighters and their families. And so following this, Trump got a ton of backlash for this move from both sides, even getting called out by some of his main supporters like Lindsey Graham and Mitch McConnell, with many arguing that Trump had basically given Turkey a green light to go ahead and start a war and kill a U.S. ally. Others also argued that in addition to sending a really bad message about how the United States treats its allies, the move would also allow ISIS to regroup. This because the Kurdish forces would now be fighting a military attack, so they wouldn't be able to keep a stable hold on the region or stop ISIS fighters from escaping from the camp. And at this point, Trump, for his part, said that he opposes the Turkish invasion and that his administration had warned Erdogan not to do it. But he also said that the Turkish military operation was inevitable because of a long history between the Turks and the Kurds. But around this, many experts, lawmakers, and world leaders have said that Turkey didn't start the attack until after Trump announced that he was removing U.S. forces from the region. And so then on Sunday, we saw U.S. Secretary of Defense Mark Esper say this while speaking on CBS's Face the Nation. So I spoke with the president last night uh, after discussions with the rest of the national security team and he directed that we begin a deliberate withdrawal of forces from northern Syria. Nesper didn't say exactly when or how many troops would be withdrawn, but he did tell Fox News the same day that the number would be less than 1,000. Although that doesn't really clear up much because the United States only had about 1,000 troops in the region, so really they couldn't withdraw more than 1,000. Also notably, this announcement came amid reports from Kurdish officials and others in the area that 800 people held in ISIS prisons broke free. Around this, Erdogan responded by saying the claims were disinformation intended to provoke the United States and others, but still Kurdish forces maintain that this was a serious security threat. And you also had others arguing that it just proved that Kurdish forces were stretched too thin by the U.S. withdrawing. Also saying that Esper's announcement that the U.S. was removing even more troops would just make the situation worse. And then, just hours after Esper's announcement, Kurdish leaders announced that they had struck a deal with the government of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, right, and saying that the Syrian government would be sending troops to help the Kurds fight Turkey. And this is a massive deal because Assad's government is backed by Russia and Iran, right? And so many people who have been critical of the removal of U.S. forces in Syria have argued that this is just going to pave the way for Russian forces allied with the Syrian government to fill this power vacuum created by the United States leaving the region. So this is being described as a 
huge turning point in Syria's eight year long war because it represents a notable shift in influence from the United States to Russia. Now responding to the move, we saw Trump on Monday tweet, after defeating 100% of the ISIS caliphate, I largely moved our troops out of Syria. Let Syria and Assad protect the Kurds and fight Turkey for their own land. I said to my generals, why should we be fighting for Syria and Assad to protect the land of our enemy? Anyone who wants to assist Syria in protecting the Kurds is good with me, whether it is Russia, China, or Napoleon Bonaparte. I hope they all do great. We are 7,000 miles away. And it appears that Russia was like, sounds great, because yesterday Russia announced that they would be sending their own troops to patrol between Turkish and Syrian forces. Now meanwhile, Trump has maintained that he will try to mediate between Turkey and the Kurds, and also that if Turkey does anything that he doesn't want, he'll go after them economically. And to that point, Trump also tweeted on Monday a statement announcing, I will soon be issuing an executive order authorizing the imposition of sanctions against current and former officials of the government of Turkey and any persons contributing to Turkey's destabilizing actions in Northeast Syria. He added that steel tariffs would be increased by 50% and that the United States will stop negotiations, quote, with respect to a $100 billion trade deal with Turkey. Also adding that the order will authorize a broad range of consequences, including financial sanctions, blocking of property, and barring entry into the United States. And notably, his announcement came just after a series of tweets from Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi and Senator Lindsey Graham. Graham saying that the two had met to discuss congressional actions in terms of Turkey and Syria, saying, Speaker supports bipartisan sanctions against Turkey's outrages in Syria. She also believes we should show support for Kurdish allies and is concerned about the reemergence of ISIS. With Pelosi tweeting, as we find ourselves in a situation where the president gave a green light to the Turks to bomb and effectively unleashed ISIS, we must have a stronger sanctions package than what the White House has suggested. And then in another separate rebuke of the president, the House today passed a resolution formally condemning Trump's move to remove US troops from Northern Syria. As we've seen, you know, this was across party lines. This had overwhelming bipartisan support. The condemnation reportedly passing with 354 votes. Also on Monday, per a Washington Post report, Trump called for a ceasefire. The Post also quoting Vice President Mike Pence saying that Trump called Erdogan on Monday and, quote, communicated to him very clearly that the United States of America wants Turkey to stop the invasion, to implement an immediate ceasefire, and to begin to negotiate with Kurdish forces in Syria to bring an end to the violence. But yesterday we saw Erdogan explicitly reject a ceasefire, saying they say declare a ceasefire, we will never declare a ceasefire. They are pressuring us to stop the operation. They are announcing sanctions. Our goal is clear. We are not worried about any sanctions. And just today, Erdogan called for Syrian fighters to lay down their weapons and leave the region immediately. And this announcement comes as Pence and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo are expected to travel to Turkey today to meet with Erdogan to try to mediate the crisis and press for a ceasefire. But also here, there have been conflicting reports about whether or not Erdogan will actually meet with Pence or Pompeo. Initially, he told Sky News, I am standing tall. I will not meet with them. They will meet with their counterparts. I will speak when Trump comes. But then later, his communications director said on Twitter, earlier today, the president told Sky News that he won't receive a U.S. delegation that is visiting Ankara today. He does plan to meet the U.S. delegation led by VP tomorrow, as confirmed in the below statement to the Turkish press. But even if they do meet, Erdogan today said that Turkey wouldn't broker a truce because, quote, they have never in its history sat down at a table with terrorist groups. And adding, we are not looking for a mediator for that. Nobody can stop us. Also, interestingly, today, uh, Trump disputed the claim that, that Erdogan would not declare a ceasefire. Are you okay? Are you okay with Erdogan saying that he is not going to do a ceasefire? He didn't say that at all. Also saying this of the Kurds. And uh, the Kurds are much safer right now, but the Kurds know how to fight. And as I said, they're not angels. They're not angels. If you take a look, you have to go back and take a look. But they fought with us. Now, we paid a lot of money for them to fight with us, and that's okay. He also seemed to echo what Erdogan said when Kurdish forces reported that ISIS prisoners had escaped. So they can take care of ISIS. We have them captured. The United States captured them. Some were released just for effect, to make us look a little bit like, oh, gee, we got to get right back in there. But yeah, ultimately, that's where we are right now. And you have Turkey and Syria engaged in a violent military standoff. As of right now, it is unclear how many military personnel and civilians have died. But what is clear is that this is tearing up a country already ravaged by war and displaced hundreds of thousands of people in a country where there are already millions of refugees. And in fact, on that note, the UN reported that at least 160,000 civilians have been displaced since the offensive began. Also adding that hospitals, schools, and other public infrastructure have been hit or have been affected by the fighting. But with this story, of course, I would really love to know your thoughts on, on it in general general, how things are developing, let me know in those comments down below. And that's where I'm going to end today's show. And hey, if you like this video, hit that like button. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and definitely tap that bell to turn on notifications, get future episodes. Also, if you're not 100% filled in, you want to watch or listen to more, you can check out that brand new podcast I did with Mia Khalifa, or maybe you just missed yesterday's show, you want to catch up, you can click or tap right there to watch that as well. But with that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces, and I'll see you tomorrow.